This is Chem 793, Nuclear Forensics. This lecture is the first lecture and is the introduction for the course. Welcome to the first lecture for Nuclear Forensics. This lecture is going to co cover the introduction and some of the course material. The readings for the course for this chapter or chapter one of the nuclear forensics analysis. And this lecture will discuss the course organization, will emphasize the outcomes of the course, provide an introduction to nuclear forensics, give an introduction to nuclear material, talk a little bit about devices, and then emphasize what are the goals of nuclear forensics. And fundamentally, nuclear forensics is entailed within the nuclear fuel cycle and weapons development as shown here, where it can actually go everywhere from mining uranium, processing enrichment, this is the same sort of process that's associated with the nuclear fuel cycle, to areas that are just like in the purple here, which are just for device development, and then other aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle that some countries have, for instance, reprocessing, and some countries don't, and then some other aspects of weapons development that has to do with materials testing. So all this encompassed within nuclear forensics, what one wants to do from a scientific point of view is understand the fundamental chemistry, fundamental nuclear reactions, and radiochemistry to identify signatures along these routes. So ideally, if you were to interdict something that looks like a device, you can figure out which part of the fuel cycle. The course objectives are listed here. They are to understand and comprehend technical aspects of nuclear forensics. We're going to emphasize the role of radiochemistry in nuclear forensics and apply what we've discussed to the nuclear fuel cycle. And other aspects of nuclear technology. So one can demonstrate how these fundamental concepts and techniques can be applied to situations of interest to nuclear forensics. The course will emphasize the role of nuclear forensics in the nuclear fuel cycle, will evaluate available tools, and assess the limitations of what's known, and also the applications of what we discuss. Aspects of pre-detonation and post-detonation analysis will be included. Pre-detonation includes aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle and materials that can be used in a device and post-detonation is what you can evaluate after an explosion. The topics that are going to be discussed in the course include a basics of radiochemistry that's related to nuclear forensics, uh, the role of applications in nuclear forensics, the chemistry and physics related to what we're going to discuss in nuclear forensics, We'll discuss some aspects of devices as they play a role in understanding concepts that could be used for technical evaluations. We'll also discuss sampling, have an overview of laboratory techniques, how signatures are applied and understanding uh, the role that forensics can play in identification of material. And we'll talk about the signatures related to the nuclear fuel cycle. We will also discuss some nuclear forensics examinations. The main textbook for this course is Nuclear Forensics Analysis by Moody, Hutchin, and Grant. This textbook and other course information will be on the Canvas website. Information on course grading is provided here. The course has a total of 100 points. The Post-lecture quizzes, 14 quizzes, one point each. So it's a total of 14 points for the post-lecture quizzes. These quizzes apply to only lectures one through 14. We'll have more than 14 lectures, and some will just be examples of forensics analysis. There will be four quizzes during the semester. Each one is worth 15 points, so that's 60 points in total. The quizzes will be due five days after posting. They can be resubmitted three days after the first submission date. Any changes between the first and second submission are at 50% of the total grade. 
There will be a final exam in the course that'll be worth 20 points total. This will be during finals week. And I will ask you to review a document on nuclear forensics and the remainder of the course will be made up through course participation points. The course outcomes are listed here. First one is to understand, utilize, and apply radiochemistry to nuclear forensics. This will utilize the chart of the nuclides, which you should be familiar with, and will, of course, emphasize fission as it plays an important role and growth and decay of isotopes. We'll also discuss how signatures can arise from applications. This will be based on different aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle and utilization of treatment and material. We'll show that certain signatures are, uh, come about from how the material will eventually be used. For instance, the amount of uh, the presence of gallium in plutonium metal has certain indications that it will be used for a device. We'll understand the basic principles of devices, a very fundamental aspect and what sort of signatures can arrive from these devices. We'll understand the types of signatures that can be derived from analysis, including time signatures, isotopic signatures, and we'll have some discussions on standards and how it relates. We'll understand the role of sample collection in nuclear forensics, what type of samples are available, how one can go about collecting these materials, um, how different laboratory methods can derive different signatures. Fundamentally, um, you can think about in terms of isotopic analysis or microscopy. One method, I'm just interested in isotopic ratios. And two, I'm interested in the physical properties of the materials. And I'll understand, uh, we'll, we'll describe how um, signatures are used in determining source and how one could use this for attributing where the material derived from. Now that we've completed the expected outcomes, let's get to some of the details and information related to the course. So the first thing is, what is nuclear forensics? Well, depending upon who you ask, there's a few different views. Some aspects of nuclear forensics include trying to determine, um, trying to collect evidence. So analysis can be performed to determine sources of material. Nuclear forensics can also be considered input into attribution. It's one of many aspects of information that can be used to attribute the source of a material. And often nuclear forensics includes focusing on tools. So in other words, more analytical based evaluation of material. So one can derive these signatures that can be then used for attribution. So in other words, nuclear forensics is really part of a number of different methods for developing information to determine the sources of material. And what are some of these materials? Well, there's a few different types of nuclear materials that could be of interest to nuclear forensics. Materials and devices are an obvious choice. So fissile isotopes, those that have special nuclear material. So things uh, for uranium, enriched in uranium-233 or uranium-235. The level of uranium-235 enrichment often defines material. Things can be depleted uranium, uh, low-enriched uranium, or high-enriched uranium. The low-enriched, high-enriched boundary is at 20% uranium-235. And there are certain types of materials that you may find in the literature, for instance, oralloy, which is 93.5% uranium-235. Older literature will have, when, if, if they're discussing this material, they'll often just list it as or alloy. And then materials that contain plutonium isotopes, even, uh, even even isotopes of plutonium, which are not fissile. Weapons grade plutonium tends to be above 93% plutonium 239. Reactor grade generally has over 8% um, plutonium 240. An example of this um, material could be something like a MOX, a mixed oxide fuel, where you'll have um, up to 25% plutonium-240 and other higher plutonium isotopes from the capture of, of plutonium-240 up to, you know, 241 and 242. Uranium-233, unlike uranium-235, is not a naturally occurring isotope. 
Uranium-233, however, can be produced by the neutron capture of thorium-232, which is naturally occurring. The reaction is shown here, where thorium-232 captures a neutron, thorium-233 is created, that beta decays, so a neutron is converted into a proton, moves up the periodic table, makes protactinium-233, that beta decays, and that makes uranium-233. This reaction uses no specialized equipment or specialized techniques to produce the uranium-233. It is simply the neutron capture on thorium-232. Some decay is needed after radiation, and this decay is driven by the protactinium-233 half-life of about a month. So you'd want to irradiate the material, let it sit for a few months, so that protactinium decays into the relatively long-lived uranium-233. You would need to do some chemical separation of uranium from thorium and other radionuclides that are present. Now, this fuel cycle generates about a third of the waste from conventional uranium-235-based reactors, which are the vast majority of reactors. The thorium fuel cycle does not produce plutonium isotopes or the higher actinides. This is one of the reasons it produces less waste. So there is no plutonium proliferation from this fuel cycle. However, as it produces a fissile isotope, uranium-233, it can be a proliferant fuel cycle. Neptunium-237 is also an actinide that can be used in a device. Neptunium can be configured to fission with high-energy neutrons. However, this isotope is not fissile. With thermal neutrons, it will not fission. You can produce neptunium-237 based upon the reactions shown here. One is neutron activation of uranium-235 building to uranium-236 that can capture another neutron, making uranium-237, which can undergo beta decay to neptunium-237. Or in fuel that has higher plutonium isotopes, plutonium-241 can undergo beta decay, making americium-241, which then undergoes alpha decay to make neptunium-237. Neptunium-237, while it can be used in advice, does not qualify as special nuclear material. Other nuclear material that is of concern to nuclear forensics is shown here. This includes the isotope americium-241. This isotope is commonly used in smoke detectors. Therefore, it's readily available commercially, and it could be used in a dispersion device. The isotope californium 252 is produced by the Department of Energy. This isotope has a half-life of around two years, and it has a high spontaneous fission branch. So it's used for remote or portable neutron activation. These isotopes here of lithium and hydrogen are used for fusion, so there's interest in understanding and tracking this material for potential applications to devices. And there's also source material, naturally occurring thorium and uranium, which can be used to produce uranium-233 from the thorium. It could be enriched to obtain uranium-235 from the uranium, or the uranium could be activated with neutrons to produce plutonium-239. Some of the special nuclear materials obviously used to derive nuclear chain reactions. One kilogram of fiss uh, fissile material releases about 17 kilotons of TNT equivalent, uh, which is often used to discuss the energetics from a device. The minimum quantity of a fission uh, fissile material that's uh, necessary for this chain reaction is called the critical mass. And here are some examples of some critical masses below. If, and it depends upon uh, geometry, these critical masses can change. So for uranium-235, depending upon the, if it's bare isolated sphere or fully tampered sphere, the critical mass can be as high as 52 kilograms and as low as 17 kilograms. Plutonium, uh, the phase changes the uh, critical mass. This has to do with the, dense, the, the phase change density of the plutonium. Civil plutonium, obviously different isotopics, as we discussed uh, in the previous slide, about the 
uh, larger amounts of plutonium-240, and then uranium-233, which has a lower critical mass than the uranium-235 isotope. And here's the example of why the plutonium has different critical masses based upon its phases. As you can see, there's changes in density as there's changes in phases. So the highest density phase is this alpha phase, which exists um, up room temperature up to about 100 degrees. And the phases uh, with the associated phase change, the density changes because the physical properties and the physical dimensions of the plutonium-plutonium interactions in the metal increase. One of the signatures in plutonium metal is the presence of gallium. Gallium stabilizes the delta phase. If, well, looking back on the previous figure, you would see that the delta phase is actually not the most dense phase. That's the alpha phase. But the delta phase is what's stabilized for devices. And here's an example of a phase diagram of the phases that are present in a plutonium gallium mixture as a function of temperature. These two phases are different, particularly the um, lower part of the phase diagram. And as you can see, this is what was reported in the United States. This was what was reported in Russia during the 70s. The differences in the phase diagrams were actually used as a scientific component to join U.S. and Russian researchers at the end of the Cold War. Um, so it was a way of getting people who were on opposite sides of the Cold War working with this material to work together to figure out what is the correct phase diagram for plutonium and gallium. So other aspects and other terms that will be used in this course have to do with definition of materials. So fissile material, those that we just discussed, uh, uranium-233, uranium-235, plutonium-239, tend to have odd number of neutrons. Um, and these are materials that can sustain a chain reaction. We also talk about fertile materials. So those are source materials that can create fissile material. So, for instance, the thorium-232 captures a neutron that creates thorium-233, that beta decays protactinium-233, and that beta decays to uranium-233. Uranium-233 is fissile. The thorium-232 is fertile. So it produces the uh, fissile uranium-233 from the fertile thorium-232. Uranium-238 has the same sort of concept capture a neutron in uranium-238, you make uranium-239, that beta decays to neptunium-239, and that then beta decays to plutonium-239. Enrichment of material can also produce fissile material. For instance, as we uh, natural, natural uranium is only 0.7%, uranium-235, however, through enrichment processes, that material can be enriched in uranium-235 causing it to go from a fertile to a uh, fissile component. There's also uh, production and reactor types that can be used to uh, derive differences in fissile material. Right, so how can these be different? Well, think of the neutron energies. You can have a fast neutron, a thermal neutron, and a can-do reactor, or a can-do reactor. The fuel is very different. It's uh, so for these two, a fast and a thermal reactor, uranium can be enriched. With a can-do, it actually uses heavy water. So the uranium enrichment is not uh, a consideration. It uses natural uranium. So the isotopics are different. Those initial isotopics coupled with the neutron energy will give different ratios of isotopes that are produced. They'll, those will provide signatures for how the material was produced and getting an idea of which reactor was used. And about one gigawatt of electric burns about one ton of fissile material annually. And because of this, you can look at how much uh, energy is produced worldwide. About 200 kilograms of plutonium is produced annually. Um, and about 70 tons of plutonium 
are formed in a reactor worldwide. So um, this is about one reactor type, and this is how much is made worldwide. Now, obviously, most of the plutonium that's produced sits in a reactor, sits in the spent fuel, and is not separated. And then even if one does separate it, the isotopics are different. They tend to be higher in the uh, isotopes of 240 and above. However, they can also uh, be used as fuel and provide a component for fissile reactions. Let's have a brief overview of nuclear reactors. Obviously, nuclear reactors are used to produce the fissile material that's used in devices. They need fissile material to operate themselves. And let's go over some of these basic components of the reactors. We will describe later in the course more details, special type of reactors, but we'll use the first reactor, the Chicago pile, as a demonstration. All reactors have fuel, and these fuels can come in different chemical forms, oxides, metals, others listed here. And generally, these reactors are going to use uranium or plutonium isotopes as fissile components. Most reactors use uranium in uranium-235. Reactors produce heat. Therefore, there's some cooling that's necessary. The cooling can be air, water, CO2, liquid metals. And there's cladding associated with fuels. And this cladding is designed to keep the fuel separate from the coolant. There are some reactor designs, like molten salt reactors, where they're combined. But right now, let's just focus on some of these more basic reactors. And then there's moderators. And moderators are used to slow down neutrons so that the neutrons are at energies where you have a higher probability of fission occurring with a neutron of a slower energy that interacts with uranium-235. Moderators can be protons. It could be carbon. It could be heavy water. In protons, it could be water itself. And again, this is used to slow the neutrons down. In some reactors, the coolant, water, and the moderator protons are the same. In December 2nd, 1942, the first man-made reactor was made. A figure is shown here. This reactor was produced at the University of Chicago. The PI on the project was Enrico Fermi. The moderator was graphite and the reactor was air-cooled. Typical reactor fuel is shown here, where you have the uranium in this cylindrical form, and it's surrounded by cladding, and the cladding material keeps the fuel separate from the solution, and the bundles of the cladded fuel are put together and are used in the reactor system. Here is an example of an existing commercial reactor, a pressurized water reactor. The dimensions of the reactor are provided here. The vessel height is around 12 meters. Wall thickness, the inside diameter, the mass, many metric tons, hundreds of metric tons. The maximum pressure that this operates under is 2,500 PSI, and the water temperature is at 340 degrees. What happens in a reactor is that it produces heat. This heat is then transferred to another water loop. This water loop produces steam. The steam turns a turbine, and that generates electricity. There are 61 operating pressurized water reactors in the United States. There are almost 300 worldwide. Overall, there are around 437 total commercial nuclear reactors operating in the world. And again, the pressurized water reactor is one of the more common ones. The history of device development starts obviously with the Manhattan Project and continued on to the Cold War. The first, actually the first device was the Trinity device, but the, the first two that were used for uh, military purposes, Little Boy was a uranium device. Total mass was a little over 4,000 kilograms. Enrichment level was relatively high, not as high as what can what is achievable today. It had a 1% of the uranium fissioned, and that resulted in about a 13 kiloton yield. The details on the device are shown here. It was a uranium gun barrel type device 
where you had a hollow uranium bullet and a cylinder trigger. Fat Man was the plutonium device. It had six kilograms of plutonium, which was enriched. Uh, it wasn't enriched. It had a level of plutonium-239 that's greater than, uh, that was around 95%. Total mass was a little bit more than Little Boy at 5,000 kilograms. It was had a higher efficiency and a coupling with that was a higher yield. And you can see the device was a little bit more complicated as opposed to this conventional explosive with a gun barrel type. The uh, details are shown, not the complete details, just the schematics and general information is shown here. And here's an example of the physical sizes of the two devices that were used, uh, that were developed as part of the Manhattan Project. As the Cold War progressed, these uh, designs were improved upon, yields were increased, and uh, the, the size would also increase the size of where the blast influenced areas. An example of modern thermonuclear weapons are shown here, where um, you have a different number of stages, much more complex, and including tritium, uh, deuterium tritium gas, which can be used for a uh, fusion, a uh, fission fusion device. Some information on nuclear weapons archives are shown here. Again, the changes would be that uh, increase in the yield from uh, fusion meant that you need the presence of tritium. So you could either use a DT or a lithium deuterium. The lithium would be able to make tritium in situ. There was some improvement on the explosives ends and then alloys were also used for the plutonium. This also uh, entailed extensive testing and evaluation. Obviously, uh, at UNLV, we understand this from the Nevada test site. Historic uh, tests were performed there. The, uh, in the Soviet Union, there, they also had similar test sites. And the US produced about 100 tons of plutonium-239 and uh, almost 1,000 tons of highly enriched uranium during the Cold War effort. Information about the number of warheads in different countries is shown here. The actual numbers can be difficult to determine, and I want to emphasize that these values are for warheads. That is one component that contains a critical amount of material. Missiles may have multiple warheads, so the actual number of nuclear weapons can vary. The United States, as shown here, has around 5,000 warheads. Russia has up to double that amount. France, China, Britain, fewer. And then some states that are non-declared nuclear powers listed here, anywhere from as low as 20 up to 100 weapons. The international control of nuclear weapons is based upon treaties. These treaties are between declared nuclear powers. I would like to note that usage of fission for power is agreed as peaceful usage. The International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, which is involved in numerous treaties, was formed for the peaceful usage of nuclear technology. Some treaties that have been negotiated include the Limited Test Ban Treaty, this was between the United States, the Soviet Union, and Britain. It prohibited nuclear explosions within the Earth's atmosphere, the oceans, and in outer space. In 1970, 190 nations signed the Treaty on the Nonproliferation of Nuclear Weapons. This limited development of nuclear weapons. Nations that did not sign this include Israel, India, and Pakistan. North Korea did sign it originally, but then later withdrew. In 1992, the United States halted testing of nuclear weapons at the Nevada test site. These were underground nuclear tests at the time. Additionally, security summits from 2002 to the present day evaluated and discussed unconventional weapons, weapons of mass destruction, subnational entities, terrorist organizations, and specific nations such as Iran and North Korea. A primary route to control the spread of nuclear weapons would be to control the spread of special nuclear material. However, special nuclear material has been distributed since the earliest days of nuclear technology. Atoms for Peace, a program for utilizing nuclear material for peaceful uses, 
has distributed around 13 tons of high enriched uranium and around 750 kilograms of plutonium from 1950 to 1991. The plutonium was used for fuel works and the high enriched uranium has been used for production of medical isotopes. The impact on commercial nuclear power also has an influence with special nuclear material. In the United States, the, there was a policy to directly dispose of used nuclear fuel. This policy was a presidential order that has been reversed. The direct disposal of used fuel prevents any separation of plutonium reprocessing or the chemical separation of used fuel to reuse it has the potential for plutonium separation and plutonium use in devices. This is another route for the spread of special nuclear material. Around 230 kilograms of plutonium is produced in a commercial reactor annually. Previously, we said around 200. So again, this, these are estimates. The values can really vary. There are currently 437 reactors. This number grows on a regular basis. Some nations like China rapidly building nuclear power plants. At this rate, there's around 100 metric tons of plutonium that's produced annually. Granted, most of this plutonium remains in the reactor. And you can compare this to the 70 metric ton estimate that was made earlier in this lecture. Here are some data showing the initial sources of fissile material and explosive device tests by weapon states. This is chronological, so the first was the United States in 1945. The last was North Korea in 2006. And you can look at the growth and increase of number of weapon states. 1940, there were two. 1950, there was an addition. In 1960, two nations, and then from 70 to present day, only a handful. And that does show some success in keeping nuclear weapons to a limited number of nations. One major proliferation concern was resultant from the breakup of the former Soviet Union, in which nuclear material with limited protection and accountability could be sold from former Soviet sites. Some smuggling and scams did occur. The relative number is shown here, where there was a big spike up until the mid-90s. The number has been reduced. And some of the scams resulted from the lack of knowledge on nuclear material. One case involved red mercury, which is a fictitious material that there was also discussion on suitcase weapons from the former Soviet Union, which were not real. And this figure here shows specific seizures, and this does include information about the amount of material. There's some note where uh, there are some kilogram levels of high enriched uranium, but most generally the material is of lower amounts. However, some of these amounts of high enriched uranium are certainly of concern. So the goals of nuclear forensics are listed here. When from nuclear forensics, there's an interest in determining the attributes of a material. Where is it produced? What is it? What is it made for? How was it transported? What's the route it was transported? Um, it utilizes traditional forensics, you know, what you would see for police investigations, fingerprints, DNA, pollens, and also uh, forensics that are related to the fact that the material is radioactive. So one can get, can get an idea, idea of the source of the special nuclear material from radioactive decay, time since separations, and from information related to the morphology, the chemical form. Where does this material fit within nuclear forensics analysis? Some areas of interest are shown here. One area is the weapon of concern. There are two fundamental types of devices or weapons that would be of concern for nuclear forensics. One is an improvised nuclear device. This is basically a non-standard fission or fusion device. There's a low likelihood of this device occurring due to material accountability and the technical difficulty. However, the outcome of such a device being used in an urban setting would be 
huge. More likely device would be a radiological dispersal device. This is a higher uh, probability compared to the improvised nuclear device, but it has lower consequences. And this is basically something that would have an explosion and disperse radioactive material. There was also discussion and interest on pre and post detonation. So material analysis before or after an explosion. Pre detonation, you would do isotopic analysis to evaluate actinide and fission products. This would help identify the material source, separation methods, the type of reactor used to produce the material, and any dating to get an idea of when separations have occurred. For improvised nuclear device, assessment of nuclear source material, the design, the metallic apparatus, density, alloying elements, other aspects of the device would certainly provide signatures. And this would also include modeling of the device to understand the yield. In a post-detonation environment, for the improvised nuclear device, one would utilize methodologies and measurement systematics developed from nuclear testing. The evaluation of residual actinides, fission products, both minor and major, and activation species would be performed. Assessment of device material design operation, near vicinity conditions, and other characteristics that would be possible with post-shot inorganic and radiochemical analysis would be performed. For the radiological dispersal device, analysis would use radiochemistry and conventional forensics to examine materials. And part of this, the DOE has the capacity to perform standard forensics analysis on materials that could be contaminated with radionuclides. The material source and route is also of interest for nuclear forensics analysis. The data on the special nuclear material itself can provide information on the source of the material, the methods and procedures used to produce the material could identify its origin. Pathway, how the material got from its original location to its final location can be determined with traditional forensics. Overall, the need to attribute the material will be performed. This is identification of what, the, what is the material, where is it from, is there more of this material? How did it get from where it was made to where it is? And who was involved? The application of attribution can be used for legal evidence. Not all attribution is necessarily for legal evidence. However, if one is going to apply this for legal evidence, there are certain aspects that need to be considered, including the preservation of the sample, chain of custody, and quality assurance, quality control of the analysis methods. So within this lecture, we discussed nuclear forensics. What does it mean? Sometimes it means different things to different groups. What are the different types of nuclear material? There's classes of nuclear material, fissile, fertile, discussion on critical masses, and a little bit of a review and overview on how materials are produced and what are the sources. We talked very briefly about device development, how they went from simple to more complex, the inclusion of tritium, all these changes, introduce signatures, and we also talked about the goals of nuclear forensics. Here are some example questions you should be able to answer from the lecture. Now, the lecture did review a lot of material, went into depth, and a lot of the information is something that we'll discuss in more detail throughout the semester. So, for example, production routes, neutron activation. We will discuss these terms and concepts in greater detail. What you should be able to get out of the lecture are based upon some of these study questions. So, example, what is special nuclear material? Well, special nuclear material is material that can undergo fission by thermal neutrons. Uranium isotopes, uranium-233 and uranium-235 are special nuclear material. And actually, by definition, plutonium isotopes, 238 to 242, are also considered special nuclear material. However, the even isotopes do not undergo fission by thermal neutrons. And for plutonium, plutonium-239 is the key isotope. Is the amount of plutonium-239 higher in reactor-grade plutonium or in weapons-grade plutonium? Weapons-grade plutonium has at least 93% plutonium-239. This is higher than reactor-grade. And what is critical mass? 
That is the minimum quantity of fissile material for a chain reaction. Information on the critical mass is presented in this table below. Uranium-235 can be separated from uranium-238 in natural uranium by enrichment methods. What are some of these enrichment methods? Well, gaseous diffusion, a gas centrifuge, electromagnetic separation, similar to an ICP mass spec, and laser separations are routes in which one could achieve isotopic separation of uranium-235 from uranium-238. How is plutonium produced in a reactor? Most reactors are uranium-based, where 3 to 5% of uranium is uranium-235. The remainder is uranium-238. That uranium-238 can capture a neutron, makes uranium-239. That uranium-239 decays by beta, producing neptunium-239. And that neptunium-239 decays by beta, producing plutonium-239. And overall, about how many nuclear warheads are there worldwide? The number can be difficult to pin down. It is well known. It's just not in the open literature. There's around 15,000 nuclear warheads worldwide. When you have completed this lecture, please comment on the blog and respond to the lecture one quiz. Mm-hmm. <laughs>